Hello. In this video, we'll be going over the CS188 uh, midterm one prep worksheet. So for this first problem, we'll be going through the mechanics of search, as well as some properties of heuristics for the A star search algorithm. Um, so to do these problems, I like going through and storing what the actual algorithm stores, as well as keeping track of previous nodes in order to actually uh, return the final path that would be returned by one of these algorithms. All of these algorithms only differ in what queue structure they use uh, to determine the next node to expand in the algorithm. For breadth-first search, we'll be using a first-in, first-out object. For uniform cost search, we'll be using a priority queue where the priority is given by the total cost of the path to reach that node from the start node. For depth-first search, we'll be using a last-in, first-out queue. Okay, so for breadth-first search, we're going to first start by inserting the start node S onto the queue. At the next step, our fringe will contain the two nodes we add from S, which are A and G. So I'm going to say that A came from S and G also came from S. I'm putting these two in parentheses to denote that they came in at the same level. And so when I pull off the next node, I'll be pulling it off based on a tie-breaking scheme within these two pulls. So because I'm going in first in, first out order, I pull off, I, I, I've already pulled off S, I can pull off A now. Um, based on this, I'm left with G, which came from S. And then from A, I can insert B, which came from A, and C, which came from A, again at the same level. At the next step, I pull off G, which came from S. Uh, and then because that's the goal node, I'm already done. In order to trace back the path, I can just say that from G, I came from S by looking at that backtracking pointer at the top. Uh, and then that's the final path returned by this algorithm. So that would just be SG. So for the next part of this problem, we'll be using uniform cost search to find the path. So in addition to storing the previous node uh, that got me to the node I'm looking at when I'm expanding these children, um, I'm also going to store the total path cost that I incurred to get to that node. So what we'll again start with S in our fringe. We'll insert A and G. Um, but A now has a cost of 1 and G has a cost of 12. So I'll have A, which came from S with cost 1. Um, and then G, which came from S with cost 12. Now I'm going to pull pr only in order of priority. So I'll pull A. Um, I'm left with G. And then from there, I insert B and C. Now the total path cost to get to B is the cost to get there to A plus the edge cost from A to B, which gives me a cost to B coming from A of 4. And likewise for C, we get 2. At the next step, we pull off C, which has the lowest cost. And from C, we can insert D and G into our queue. The cost to get to C is 2, so the new cost to D is 3. And then we can update the cost to G, which will be 2 plus 2, which is 4. We can then pull off D, which is the next smallest one. Um, and we're left with, at the last step, we had to update that G now came from C for that lowest cost. So in the fringe and the next step, we have G, which came from C with cost 4, B with cost 4. And then from D, we can now insert G into the queue uh, with total cost 3 plus 3, which is 6. But we already see that G is in the queue with a cost of 4 coming from C, uh, and so we don't have to do anything. At the next step, we have two nodes with cost 4, and we can perform tie-breaking, so we would pull B off of the fringe. Um, from B, we can insert D, and so we're left with G, and then D, which will have cost 7. Uh, and then we pull off G from the fringe, and we're done, and we have a path of cost 4. Um, to trace back, we have G, which came from C, um, when we pulled C off the fringe, that came from A. Uh, and when we pulled A off the fringe, that came from S. So we have a resulting path, um, S, A, C, G.
For depth first search, we'll continue the same procedure where we just modified the queue structure to be last in first out now. So again, I'll insert S, um, I'll pull it off of the fringe, and I'll insert A and G into the queue, um, both at the same level. Um, again, I'm now going to break ties in alphabetical order, so I pull A, I'm left with G, uh, and then I insert B and C into the fringe um, at the same level, coming from A. Now because I'm doing last in first out, I pull from this second tuple in the fringe, and I break ties in alphabetical order to get B, which came from A. So at the next step, I insert D, the one child of B. Um, and now, because that was the last thing I inserted, that's the first thing I pull off. So I'm left with G, C, and then from D, I can insert G, coming from D. And again, the next thing I pull off is that last thing I inserted, which is G. And then, because that's the goal, I'm done. I can trace back my path, um, see that G came from D, which came from B, which came from A, which came from S. Um, and then we're done. Now, for the next part of this problem, um, it's simply asking, given an arbitrary consistent heuristic, what path would A star graph search return? And what this is really testing is if you know that when you use a consistent heuristic, A star graph search will always return the optimal path. Um, because we did not use a heuristic here and we already know about optimality of uniform cost graph search, uh, we can immediately jump to the same path returned by part B, which is S, A, C, G. An alternative way to look at this is by using a uh, trivial heuristic, which is guaranteed to be consistent. But it would just reduce the behavior of A star to that of uniform cost graph search. For this next part, we'll be testing on admissibility and consistency of heuristics for A star. So to remind you what that means, uh, heuristic H is admissible if for each node n, we have that H of n is less than or equal to h star of n, uh, where h star of n denotes the true cost of the cheapest path from n to the goal node. Uh, consistency is defined as sort of a triangle inequality uh, where for each edge, a to b, I have that h of a is less than or equal to the edge cost from a to b plus the heuristic cost uh, to b. So it's just changing how much um, it's just bounding how much I changed my heuristic value based on this edge cost from A to B. So to test admissibility, uh, it suffices to find some state that overestimates the true cost uh, to the goal. So if we can find that, we'll know that the heuristic is inadmissible. So just from inspecting this, we see that the heuristic value for H1 of S is 5, um, but we found in the previous part that the optimal path had total cost 4. Uh, and so because of that, we know that um, h of s is greater than h star of s, and so h1 is not admissible. Um, from our, what we also know is that uh, any consistent heuristic is admissible. Consistency is a strictly stronger condition. Um, and because of that, if a heuristic is not admissible, it is also not consistent. And so we know immediately that H1 is also not consistent. Uh, to test admissibility of H2, um, we can go about this using two different ways. One is that we could go through each node and see whether it violates the heuristic admissibility condition we defined up here. Um, another way is to compare it to H1. So the problem we found in H1 is that we overestimated the value for S. Um, we could fix that by reducing it to 4. If we did that, we would end up with some heuristic H1 prime um, that is admissible because we fixed the only problem with it, which was the overestimate for, uh, for state S. Now we can find that H2 is admissible by seeing that it, this modified heuristic H1 prime actually dominates H2, which means that h1 prime of n is greater than or equal to h2 of n uh, for each node n. And because of that, 
we know that if an admissible heuristic dominates another heuristic, the latter heuristic is also guaranteed to be admissible. To test consistency of the second heuristic, H2, we'll go back to our graph and check uh, for a node that violates that triangle inequality. So in particular, if we look at the heuristic value H of S, uh, which is 4, um, the heuristic value for the next node, A, is 2, but the edge cost from S to A is 1, um, and so we'll violate the triangle inequality because um, we do not have that 4 is less than or equal to uh, 1 plus 2, which is 3. Okay, and that's it for this problem. In this problem, we'll be coming up with a minimal state space representation for a given search problem. So the search problem is that we have this n by n grid world with different walls. We have two bugs that can move around in this world at each step. And the goal is for these two bugs to meet in the same square. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know the initial positions of these bugs. And so what we have to do is we have to encode that uncertainty into the actual algorithm. Um, so to do that, we can say that for each space, um, we can know that either a bug could be in that space or a bug definitely cannot be in that space. So each state can be represented uh, as an element of all the binary strings of length mn, um, where I'm just sort of flattening out this string so that um, I can map each position on this grid to the value for whether or not a bug could be in that position. Um, the size of this state space is simply the number of binary strings of length mn, which is 2 to the mn. So to devise an admissible heuristic for this problem, uh, we're going to consider what we know about the cost to get to the goal state for this problem. So the, the tricky part about this is that although the game ends when the two bugs meet in the same position, uh, when we're formulating this as an actual search problem, we have to specify the goal state. And the goal state only occurs when we are completely confident that the bugs could not be in any other position except in um, this same, except if they're in the same position. And so the goal state simply consists of all of the binary strings where there's a one in a single position and every other value is zero. Um, so what we can do for this is we can actually kind of take a worst case perspective and consider the largest possible distance that these bugs could be apart. Because I know that I have to move at least that far in order to set all of the values along those positions to zero except the center position where they meet. Because again, the goal is to set all of the other values to zero uh, and not just let the bugs meet in the center. We have to be completely confident that they could be nowhere else. So in, what I can do is I can consider uh, the maximum over all positions, uh, v and w, where I'll say that the, that the uh, binary value at positions v and w are both 1. Uh, and then I'll just take the maximum over the Manhattan distance uh, between these two positions. Um, what this will let me do is consider the worst case option where I have to set all of those ones along the path between V and W to zero, except that center path, center position where they meet. Um, you could also consider the minimum because this maximum heuristic dominates that minimum one, but this maximum one will approach the true optimal cost uh, and just result in better overall uh, convergence fee.